thanks everyone for uh, being here and listening to this talk. So this is uh, a new one for us. So I put this together, um, a talk on biomechanics, uh, metallurgy and uh, various spinal implants. So um, this is the outline for the talk. We'll go over some backgrounds, then some relevant basic science, then go over individual spinal implants and the um, uh, choices thereof. Uh, we'll go over implant uh, disc arthroplasty as well, and then some future considerations in the area. So for some background, uh, non-surgical treatment for scoliosis and spinal disorders, including traction binders and uh, bracing have been described as early as the fifth century uh, BC by Hippocrates. Uh, they were later described in detail by uh, Galen around uh, the turn of the uh, century. Um, and really, um, surgical treatment of the spine was not um, commonly practiced until very recently. So the first documented surgical treatment of scoliosis was by Jules Guerin in France in 1839. Uh, he performed a subcutaneous tenotomy as, and myotomies uh, as an adjunct to his bracing uh, protocol for over 1,300 patients. Um, despite this being the first described surgical treatment for scoliosis, um, it actually caused considerable controversy in the field when he first published it and actually resulted in him being banned from practicing medicine for the rest of his life and exiled from his home country of France to Belgium. Um, so after that happened, uh, surgery for the spine was uh, delayed by about 100 years. Um, and abandoned uh, by practitioners with the focus really shifting toward various iterations of bracing and uh, full body casting. So this is the, this is Louis Sayre's um, very famous uh, bracing that was happening around this time, the, the full body casting uh, with various kind of traction contraptions uh, being placed on the patients before uh, the casting in order to allow for correction. So uh, there was started to be scattered reports in the uh, early 1900s of spinal implants being used for stabilization of fracture dislocations, as well as uh, instability related to POTS disease. Um, these started really in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, and then it wasn't until the first half of the 20th century that, uh, that more detailed publications began to happen. Um, with that, a, a number of names that we're all familiar with, Dr. Hibbs, Dr. Risser and Dr. Cobb all con uh, contributed to uh, popularization of hybrid surgical embracing techniques. Again, going back to the uh, technique that had been described 100 years earlier um, uh, and then essentially abandoned for a long time uh, for the treatment of POTS disease as well as scoliosis. Um, these are just some drawings of uh, in early publications of kind of an abscess from POTS disease that. Um, um, that was drained, and this is the, the uh, surgeon's rendition of what it looked like. Um, in 1955, uh, kind of it was the dawn of the modern age of spine surgery. Dr. Harrington basically devised uh, the use of rods in the spine with the Harrington rod. It involved uh, custom manufactured steel rods, as well as a series of ratchets that were designed to reduce the spine to the rods. Um, this is, the, to the right, you can see some of his early uh, early work, um, you can see he actually published this in, in his handwriting below before surgery, 115 degree curve and uh, in intensive care, 64 degree uh, curve afterwards. So uh, there continued to be an evolution of rod-based reduction fixation and stabilization techniques uh, that evolved since that time. These ultimately included uh, loopy wires um, to to reduce the spine, uh, the spinal components to the rods. Uh, later on, use of hooks, and then um, ultimately the use of pedicle screw instrumentation, and then most recently the kind of widespread use of inner body devices. Uh, modern advances in biomechanical understanding, surgical approaches, as well as uh, biomaterial science, have fueled a rapid progression in the field of spine surgery over the last uh, three to four decades. So we'll get into some basic relevant science at this time. And the, I could get really into depth here and I'm not going to, I'm just gonna kind of go over some basic um, modulus um, of elasticity of uh, common spinal materials. Um, and, and that'll relate to kind of the choice of implants later on. 
as opposed to really getting into spinal biomechanics. I think for the purpose of a half hour talk, um, I'm going to try to avoid getting in the weeds there and assume that a, a good chunk of the audience has a reasonably good understanding of spinal uh, biomechanics. So um, on the right, you can see a uh, basically a graphic of various uh, common biomaterials and their Young's modulus. Uh, the most important one to focus on is cortical bone, uh, cortical and cancellous bone on the left, and then the comparison of all the different uh, materials to that. The ideal, in theory, the ideal instrument, um, the ideal material to um, instrument the spine should be uh, close to that of cortical bone. Um, and so you see here the stainless steel, which is kind of the classic metal used in, in, um, in surgical uh, procedures, uh, as well as cobalt chrome, are, have a very high modulus of elasticity. It's much, much greater than normal bone. Um, uh, titanium has a modulus which is significantly higher than cortical bone, but it's still but much less than stainless steel or cobalt chrome. And peak has a modulus which is very similar to bone, which we'll talk about at length uh, for the rest of the talk. So in terms of spinal fusion devices, we'll start with rods, then get into pedicle screws and cages. Um, of course, I could, we could get into depth in some of the other, the biomaterials for other uh, implants as well that are used in spine. But again, um, I'm trying to keep this relatively brief for the audience. So in terms of goals of spinal fusion, um, we have a variety of historical implant choices. Uh, the primary goal of instrumentation um, in the past has been to provide mechanical stabilization in order to pr promote osseous fusion. And um, there was um, some of the early landmark studies in spine um, were the ones which showed that uh, instrumentation um, increased fusion rates versus in situ fusion uh, procedures. So really that was kind of the historic goal. More recent, recently, we've improved our understanding of the importance of the mechanical alignment of the spine on both medium and long-term patient outcomes. And this has really shifted our focus of the instrumentation beyond just um, increasing our chances of a successful fusion and more towards improvement in the patient's mechanical alignment as well as being a, as a primary goal. Secondary goals of instrumentation include stabilization uh, uh, in order to protect the neural elements, indirect decompression of the neural elements and avoidance of complications. So early rods, uh, which as I talked about before were developed by Paul Harrington were uh, made of stainless steel. Um, we're rarely using stainless steel in uh, modern rod constructs. Uh, most typically modern rods either utilize titanium alloy or cobalt chrome in, in the um, setting of deformity. Peak is also used uh, relatively rarely, but it's used. The main reason that these uh, the cobalt chrome peak and titanium are used over stainless steel is that they have improved uh, compatibility and corrosion resistance. Titanium is by and far the most popular um, type of uh, metal used uh, in spine. Its modulus of elasticity is the most similar to bone of all the metals we use. Uh, it's very biocompatible and it has minimal artifact on MR imaging compared to cobalt chrome or titanium. Cobalt chrome is relatively widely used, um, not as much as titanium, but it's it's out there. It's substantially stiffer than titanium. It's more bio and it's more biocompatible than stainless steel. Um, so it's largely supplanted uh, stainless steel um, in terms of uh, uh, trying to get a really stiff rod when that's required. So it's commonly util utilized in deformity applications where um, there's concern about uh, uh, pseudos across um, sacral, uh, the sacral um, the uh, lumbosacral junction uh, and, and things like that. Um, it does have significantly more artifact on MRI than titanium, uh, which we often see when we're trying to get uh, post-operative MRIs on these patients, but it does have less than stainless steel. So it's an improvement compared to those. Uh, peak rod has the, have the closest modulus to bone, um, which allows a theoretical greater load sharing between inner the inner body implants and the end plates. Uh, it's also radiolucent, which can be advantageous in terms of post-operative imaging, particularly MRI. It is, of course, disadvantageous when, uh, when we're trying to identify a complication with regards to that implant. So if, it were, if we think the rod has fractured, 
it can be very difficult to see with a peak rod. Um, it's also, you, they have to be um, pre-bent. There's no way to contour them um, without risk of fracturing them in the operating room. And my understanding is they generally are significantly more expensive than the alternatives. So they're not widely used, um, but there are some applications that we've talked about in the past for potential use of peak rods. Uh, intraoperative rod bending uh, tends to result in notching um, the way we do it with French benders and, and uh, other devices like that. Um, that can reduce the mechanical stability and there's a number of, a number of studies that have, have shown that. It can increase the risk of rod fracture. Then, and then this is the rationale for the idea of pre-contoured patient-specific rods, um, which can be uh, either, either just pre-contoured to match um, an expected lumbar lordosis, which is, which is common with implant manufacturers, or it can be patient specific based on, um, based on CT planning uh, and preoperative planning for the, the surgery. And so the concept there is if it's manufactured with a curve close to where you want it, then you don't have to do as much bending in the operating room and the risk of um, notching uh, and causing biomechanic inferiority is, is lower. So this is a mechanical analysis of, of this concept. Um, so the authors did an experimental comparison um, with a kind of sawbones model of notched free curved rods versus conventionally bent uh, notched rods, uh, titanium and cobalt chrome. And you can see on the right, they found that as soon as the cobalt chrome rods were notched, their ultimate load was significantly lower than when they were not free, uh, pre-bent. So, um, so you can see that that, that notching is, is certainly a problem in terms of the ultimate load. The overall stiffness was essentially identical. <clears throat> so the, the rods were basically as stiff as before until they fractured. So they would basically fracture faster. In terms of pedicle screws, um, pedicle screw and rod constructs have become at this point, the standard of care for instrumented uh, fusion of posterior final elements. Um, they distribute posterior column forces through the middle and the anterior columns, which uh, can be quite helpful. And they allow for powerful correction maneuvers compared to prior technologies. Most uh, pedicle screws are made of titanium alloy, um, although there's a significant variation in pedicle screw technology. Um, there's um, loosening and pull-out kind of remain the primary problems with pedicle screws, particularly in patients who have osteopenia or osteoporosis. Um, and the screw bone interface um, is thought to be especially important uh, for clinical success and pull-out prevention. Uh, various iterations on pedicle screw designs have been proposed and manufactured by all of the different manufacturers uh, in, with the thought uh, being to decrease the risk of loosening, pull-out, and failure. Um, surface treatments are particularly pop popular. Um, uh, Hydroxyapatite is probably the most common, but um, there's descriptions of medical screws with calcium phosphate, tantalum, and titanium plasma spray as well. Um, PMMA cement augmentation is also common. So um, the original description of PMMA cement augmentation was basically performing a vertebroplasty and then putting the screw in before the vertebroplasty dried, um, which, is, which is a common, uh, common practice uh, in patients with osteoporosis. Um, newer pedicle screw designs, uh, many of them are fenestrated uh, and, and those will allow injections through the screw to allow um, cement uh, extravasation into the vertebral body after the screw has been placed. So this was a clinical study that just came out in May um, that was an observational study out of Seoul. Um, they followed patients with osteoporosis who underwent uh, posterior pedicle screw fixation alone. Um, and they looked at patients who, went, who underwent pedicle screw fixation, which was not augmented by cement. They looked at patients with solid screws that had cement augmentation right before the screws were placed. And then they looked at patients that had fenestrated screws with cement augmentation. Um, again, it's it's a it's a observational kind of retrospective study, so these patients weren't randomized or anything like that. This was uh, surgeon choice. 
but they did find that there was a 50% incidence of screw loosening in the unaugmented group, 13% in the solid augmented group, and 2% in the fenestrated group. They did note a almost 6% rate of screw fracture in the fenestrated group. Um, so this is kind of looking at that concept of uh, cement augmentation and fenestrated screws. In terms of cages, this is probably where we'll spend the most time in this talk. Um, inner body cages serve multiple functions. Uh, they can restore anatomic height of the intervertebral disc space, uh, restore the lordosis in collapsed disc spaces, restore the cephalocaudal height of the neuroforamina bilaterally. They can stabilize intervertebral, the intervertebral space. They can allow for controlled uh, uh, in, um, implantation of bony uh, autograft or allograft as opposed to just placing it in the disc space. They allow for fusion from the end plate to the end plate as well as around and through the cage. And they, some implants allow on growth of the bone from the vertebral body end plates to the cage itself. So there's a whole bunch of uh, biomaterials that have been used for cage construction. The most common are allograft, titanium alloy, ceramic peak, titanium coated peak, and uh, the new kind of hot thing is 3D printed titanium. The most commonly uh, used biomaterials currently are various iterations of titanium alloy and peak. So you can see the, there's a bunch of examples on the bottom from left to right, you're, you see um, machined, uh, allograft, uh, titanium implants, those are the back cages, uh, ceramic um, T-lift cage, or that's a ceramic T-lift cage, I believe, um, peak, and then on second to the right is a peak uh, lateral cage and then a 3D printed lateral cage. Um, early inner body fusions tended to use iliac autograft, um, tricortical iliac crest, um, was described as early as 1955 by Robinson and Smith and 1958 by Cloward, both for the first described ACDFs. Uh, donor site morbidity, graft reabsorption, and graft subsidence ultimately led to increasing use of alternative materials. Um, femoral cortical allograft rings um, were first described for use in ALIF by O'Brien in the late 1980s and early 1990s, and then machined allograft spacers were subsequently developed for more preci precise and reproducible implantation in both cervical and lumbar spine procedures. Um, allograft is, is beneficial, as we all know, in that it has similar osteoconductive properties to allograft. To allograft. So it has a similar um, microscopic structure. To, it, has a, the, it is bone, so it has a microscopic structure of bone, and it the the um, it provides a scaffolding for the um, for the uh, for a fusion, but it doesn't have any cells in it, so it lacks the same osteoinductive properties of um, autograft. Um, so this is a retrospective uh, review that just came out a year ago of patients at UCSF who underwent fusions with peak and structural allograft, uh, as well as plate fixation, and had minimum of two year follow up. Um, so they had machine, half the patients essentially had, or more than half the patients had machined allograft and the other half of patients had uh, peak. None of the patients had autograft. Um, their conclusion was that there was no statistically significant difference in the pseudoarthrosis rate, revision rate, or subsidence uh, and lordo lordosis loss rate between the peak cages and the structural allografts. So you can see that they're pretty, pretty equivalent in terms of um, what you can get out of them for one level, two level, and three level um, pseudoarthrosis rates. For both types of implants, you can see for two level and especially for three level, the pseudoarthrosis rate remains relatively high with it almost, almost a third of uh, patients in both groups uh, having a pseudoarthrosis at at least one of their levels uh, if they went, underwent a three or more level ACDF. Um, titanium cages or among the first artificial inner body devices devices widely utilized in spine surgery. These really started in the 1980s after um, Kuslich et al. updated the cage design of the Bagby basket, which was a cylindrical cage that was used to treat myelopathy in thoroughbred horses, uh, where it was a, a huge problem. And it was adapted for use in humans by Kuslich. This was ultimately named the Bagby and Kuslich titanium cage or the back cage. 
So these cages were first implanted in humans in 1992, and they were really popularized in the late 1990s and early 2000s. And they were used for both lumbar and cervical cases. They were um, fenestrated, allowed for bone graft to kind of fit inside the cylinder and they're threaded, which was supposed to provide early fixation to the uh, end planks. Um, they were initially designed not to be used with any posterior pedicle screw instrumentation. Um, however, they uh, did have multiple issues with subsidence and there's a lot of case reports too, to show that. So with our inter increased understanding of the importance of uh, implant footprint and spinal alignment, um, we've kind of changed the titanium implants into a more anatomic shape uh, in modern implants. In um, following the early success of allograft titanium cages, uh, following the early success in comparison to allograft in the lumbar spine, these uh, back titanium cages were largely supplanted by peak alternatives until the modern surface coating and 3D printing techniques repopularized the idea of using titanium inner body cages. Um, peak cages uh, were developed to address the drawback of the early metallic cages. Uh, they were first described with the development of the Brannington cage for Cliff in 1989. Um, peak has several advantages, the primary one being that it has a similar Young's modulus to bone. Um, which in theory decreases the stress shielding of the surrounding bone and can assist with fusion. It also has significant radiographic properties for follow-up in that it's radiolucent and it does not interfere significantly with MRI evaluation. It's also relatively bioinert and there is wear debris that's identified in these, but there hasn't, no one's documented any evidence of an inflammatory reaction from peak material. It has a similar modulus to bone, which may be protective against subsidence and uh, loss of uh, lordosis. The primary disadvantage is that it has a weak uh, surface interface and it can fracture with cage implantation. It's also a hydrophobic material and that can result in, in its inability to bond to bone. So the fusion for peak really has to occur in and around the cage and it, it's not really a bond that happens between the end plate and the cage itself. Cage migration and pseudoarthrosis have, uh, have been described uh, with PEAK as well. Um, so this is a uh, study that came out recently, it, it basically looking at um, 3D printed titanium coated and then regular PEAK um, inner bodies, uh, lateral inner bodies in a sheep model. So um, this um, basically they took a skeletal mature sheep model they did inner body fusions uh, from a lateral approach at L2, 3, and L4, 5 in 27 different sheep. They used three different cage types, um, peak, plasma pay, uh, sprayed porous titanium coated peak, they call PSP, or 3D printed titanium. They did kinematic testing, micro CT, and histologic analysis. And you can see on the right, this is the histo histologic analysis. You can see um, the top right side is the titanium cage, um, the top left is the peak, and the uh, bottom left is the peak with uh, plasma sprayed porous, um, plasma sprayed titanium on it. So basically they found that the flex, flexion extension range of motion was reduced at 16 weeks only in the 3D printed group uh, compared to the other groups. The greater, the 3D printed group had a greater uh, total bone volume in the graft window on micro CT at both eight and 16 weeks. And the histopathology similarly in, demonstrated an increased percent of bone uh, in their predefined region of interest at both eight weeks and 16 weeks. So they basically concluded that the 3D printed group provided the best, uh, uh, best result for in terms of uh, fusion in an in vivo model. <clears throat> So getting to disc arthroplasty, um, we'll start with the, the, the lumbar spine. That I put a picture of the cervical spine there by accident. I apologize for that. Um, there, the proposed uh, benefits of arthroplasty uh, include maintenance and restoration of disc function, uh, decreased detrimental biomechanical effects on adjacent segments. Uh, those are the main, main uh, proposed benefits. Unique considerations when um, considering total disc replacement design are that the disc replacement 
is designed to restore mobility, but prevents instability at the same time. Um, it has to be able to maintain a correct spinal alignment and not uh, prevent worsening of the spinal alignment. And in theory, it should be able to improve it. Um, it should be able to protect adjacent structures from advancing degeneration. And most importantly for these, um, and uniquely is that they need to maintain a long-term viability in terms of stability and wear properties, uh, as this is a mechanical device and not a fusion device. So the first lumbar osteoplasty was described in 1950, uh, the Fernstrom ball. It was basically just a stainless steel ball that was placed uh, in the intervertebral disc and in place of the nucleus pulposa. So you can see some x-rays of them uh, on the left on your screen. Um, these were actually pretty widely utilized um, a number of decades ago. Um, they were ultimately abandoned when um, the, in, by the 1980s for, um, as you can imagine, there was a lot of end plate subsidence as well as dislodgement of these balls uh, into places where they were not supposed to be. In the 1980s, the first commercially distributed total disc replacement, um, the SB Charite was developed that was um, developed out of Germany. They utilized technology that was developed ultimately for total he and knee and hip prostheses. And the implants basically consisted of a sliding polyethylene core between two metallic implants. And that polyethylene core was actually able to articulate with both of the implants, the top and the bottom. So it was very free. Uh, the implant went through three uh, generations with uh, variable success. Ultimately, there was a merger of two companies and it was shut down and in, 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 um, not because of uh, problems necessarily, but because it was, they had a com competing device. Uh, the ProDisc L uh, was a similar concept, uh, except that the polyethylene core is attached firmly to the inferior end plate uh, with the blocking mechanism, similar to a total knee. Uh, and only articulates with the upper end plate. It also utilized a blade for, for tubal fixation instead of spikes. The Maverick is a metal on metal design with cobalt chrome end plates and bearing surfaces. Um, and, and that's been described a couple of times in, in uh, disc arthroplasty literature. I haven't seen any descriptions of uh, major issues with metal on metal wear like there has been described in the total joint literature. First modern cervical disc arthroplasty was the French A cervical disc, which was later named the Prestige ST uh, and was approved in the 2007 by the FDA. It's basically a stainless steel ball and socket design with end plates that are secured by screws to the, the top and bottom vertebral bodies. Uh, the most recent iteration um, that's on the market is the Prestige LP standing for low profile. Uh, which is basically a titan titanium ceramic composite with porous coating to promote uh, ingrowth, bony ingrowth from the end plates to the top and bottom uh, end plates of the device. Uh, that was approved for one level use in 2014 and two level in 2016. And you can see that on the bottom right. Uh, there's a couple other kind of commonly utilized ones. This is the top right is the Protus C, which is a cobalt chrome uh, roughened with the cobalt chrome um, the device is probably roughened titanium uh, composite end plates that are designed to promote bony end growth. Um, the core is ultra high weight, uh, ultra high molecular weight polyethylene, uh, which is the same material used in, in hip and knee arthroplasty. Um, the Moby C uh, is again, is also well studied and approved for one and two level use. It's made of cobalt chrome with a hydroxyapatite coating and uh, ultra high weight polyethylene core. Uh, the interesting thing about this device, the polyethylene core, um, it, it are, the, the top end plate articulates with the polyethylene core and the bottom end plate, um, the polyethylene core kind of slides on it like a, like a rotating um, knee, a rotating uh, a knee polyethylene component. So in terms of uh, future considerations for these, uh, for material science and spine, um, I think the continued application of 3D printed implants is gonna be a huge story going forward, um, especially with the relatively strong evidence that's already come out uh, in favor of, of these implants. Um, patient specific implants are also an area that's getting increasing um, 
increase attention, especially with the ability to uh, print implants in 3D uh, closer to the user as well as cheaper than before. Uh, expandable devices are important in order in terms of decreasing our invasiveness uh, for procedures. Uh, biologics I didn't talk about here because it would just open a whole nother can of worms, but those are a huge component of, of uh, achieving adequate fusions as well. And then the ability of robotics to kind of uh, enter the fray and potentially add, potentially in the future, add value to, to okay. these sorts of things with the 3D uh, implants and, and, and choosing those things may be something that we're looking forward to in the future. So um, that's what I have. Thank you, everyone. Um, is there any questions? Nice job, Dan. Very nice. Yeah, Thank excellent you. job, Dan. Yeah. Not an easy topic. It was awesome. Hey, Dan, do you know who, uh, who who had furniture and balls in? Do you know which famous person had, had furniture and balls placed? I don't, actually. JFK. Anybody? Oh, no yeah. way. Yeah, JFK had furniture balls. Yeah, he was he was a long-time back pain sufferer. He was on a bunch of opiates, actually, while he's president. But he had furniture and balls in, and I don't think they work so well, actually. That's what I heard. So, wow. Yeah. Cool. Did you, all, did yeah, you also say that the back cage just started with thoroughbreds? Yeah, I mean, not for, for horses, you know, wobbler wobbler syndrome. So the horses would get the horses would get myelopathy. So they would do surgery on them to put these cages in to stabilize their necks. Wow. Yeah, it was a an orthopedic surgeon in Washington State came up with them, Dr. Bagby, yeah. and um, and then they kind of like evolved them from there. But yeah, pretty wow. interesting. That's exactly. Right. Yeah, I still see it with some frequency. You know, all those old implants; those are the ones I still see. Yeah, the yeah the BAK cage, yeah. yeah. Those hey, are Harrington he, rods, right? Yeah. Hey, Dan, yeah. you mentioned yeah, right. patient-specific um, implants, and I, I hear that a lot from like reps and, and different folks. And I don't know what you guys think, but in my mind, oftentimes the fact that the implants aren't specific to the patient's anatomy, but rather you know have built-in lower doses, etc., are helpful to try to restore some loss of sagittal alignment. I mean. Patient-specific implants, the only context in which I can think those would be useful would be maybe if you're trying to correct a, a deformity in a particular way. Do you guys have any other insight into when maybe patient-specific implants would be even beneficial? So, Annie, I think actually where it's going to end up going is that, so we talk about fusion, right? And we yeah. talk about uh, on growth onto the implant. We talk about um, the different coatings on the implants, et cetera. The problem is that as you know, when you do a lifts or laterals or T-lifts, that the surface anatomy of the implant itself is not a flat surface, right? And from patient to patient, sometimes it's concave, sometimes it's convex, sometimes it's super straight. Sometimes there's all kinds of ridges throughout the entire stinking implant. I think what's going to happen is that we're going to have uh, patient-specific implants that are designed uh, for the purposes of uh, creating end plate contact that's ideal and then being able to alter the amount of coronal or sagittal plane correction. And actually, I don't think it's coronal or sagittal. I think it's a three-dimensional correction that's going to happen. Um, and then you can dial that in at pre-op uh, for you to then come up with what you think is the best plan for your patient um, <clears throat> um, as far as segmental or, or regional or global realignment. But I think in, the in which context is going to be critical because I think the on growth is going to be better. And I bet fusion rates are going to, are going to go higher because now we're going to have like amazing surface technology along with a contact within the end plate. That's perfect. I see what you're saying. So you could still build in, you know, a lordotic cage, but the superior, you know, end plate of that cage is going to kind of just perfectly fit the, the vertebral body of the glove. But uh, yeah, that's my uh, thought. What what do you guys think about the the expandable issue? Because don't I mean, in my mind, there's so much variability that comes into play intraoperatively. And so if you if you sit and you try to plan a surgery, um, you know, in your office before and you pay a lot of money for this really high tech 3D printed uh, patient specific implant and then you can't get it. In it doesn't it, you know, it doesn't want to give you the amount of lordosis that you've built in. You know, I just think that a lot of times maybe the expandables are are a little bit uh, have have a little bit more um, potential. You know, I, I don't know whether that what your guys' thoughts are on that. 
Well, Rob, I agree yes. with you in terms of the ability. If you, you're right, if you spend a bunch of money on a 3D printed implant, you get in and from soft tissue, bone anatomy, whatever it might be, you can't get it in. You're kind of stuck because what are you going to do? Uh, do you use an off the shelf as your backup? I mean, so I agree. So these custom 3D printed ones, again, having just experienced a lens replacement where the idea was they were going to put a certain lens in and I'm not sure I got the one I'm supposed to have, but but that's a different thing. But the, the bottom line is you try and you customize it uh -oh. to the, yeah, you customize it to the, uh, the patient and then, you know, it doesn't work. You can't use that implant. So what do you do? You have to use something else. So, um, so, so I, again, the idea being that we're going to have to have variable shapes and sizes, but I'm not sure that true custom because of the issues with inoperative, interoperative variability are going to necessarily work unless you've got, unless you've got options within your um, ranges of what you're going to do. So you've, you've planned for three different potential implants so that you can use the one that fits best in that setting. Uh, and then expandable, the problem with expandables is the, the mechanisms within expandable implants compromise the bioavailability for um, biologics to grow through them. So you're compromised right. by your mechanics. So you better have really, really good surface technology because you're going to be completely reliant in on growth with, a, with an expandable. That's the problem with expandables. Um, I, so there's a company called yeah. Carl's Med. And their whole thing is actually that to make these patient specific implants with patient specific implants. And when they, when they manufacture it, they actually send you for the OR per level three sizes. Oh, wow. Right. Oh, so, okay. That's a good idea. That's a good so idea. So you have, so you have the availability to say, all right, here's one that's smaller than you actually planned. Here's one that's the exact size. Here's one that's bigger, you know, and you know, based on your plan, they can help you modify, you know, Yes, that, that makes a, that that makes would, a lot of hey, sense to me. Hey, Greg, here's, here's one thing I zero. see as a problem with those. The the one thing, Greg, when you when you let's say they make this um, implant and the surface perfectly matches the surface of your end plate, so the little ridges, the little protrusions, the the concavity. The the problem is is that's assuming that the surgeon puts the implant in in that perfect position, because if you're let's say there's ridges in the implant and your implant is one millimeter or two millimeters off. Now the ridges on the implant, the, the mountains, so to speak, are lining up with the mountain on the bone. And so you, you're actually doing the opposite. You're decreasing the surface content because it's not lined up. So the thing is when you have very specific implants like that, it's assuming that the surgeon's gonna put it in exactly the right spot. And even a little bit of variance could actually hinder more than help. So that's why I can't I can't really I can't really say that those things are going to be super helpful um, because you know a flat one when you when you just put a regular cage in you have you have a little subsidence and those ridges kind of get mashed down and and who's to say that that doesn't help with the process of you know integration into the implant so yeah I think that's a very good point Ramin and then oftentimes also you know we're we're trying to to you know in plate prep and things like that. And, and obviously if we're trying to maintain the anatomy of the patient, we're going to be limited in our ability to do that. All sort of inner body work is going to be more akin to arthroplasty inner body work. So I, I, I don't know which, it's an interesting thought. It'd be interesting to see how it all plays out. But I share your concerns. Yeah, and what happens when you end up doing a lot of carpentry and you change the morphology of right. the end plate? Yeah. Right. Well, it would be just like a disc arthroplasty. Like if you're using, you know, whatever, Moby C, you're told not to do certain things, right? Because you're going to, you're going to hurt the ability of the implant to actually do its job. So it's going to, I think it would take some, um, you know, uh, being clever about it in the operator room, right? You're not going to be as aggressive yeah. with certain things. And, and it's just a different, probably a different technique altogether. Yeah. Um, so usually, so, it's but I more, think I, I know, actually, Youthful end plate. I've actually done these on a cadaver and, and you'll be surprised. They actually just slip into their place. So, yeah. um, well, let me pose this to you. Like what, what do you do? Hey, Mundus, what do you do when you know you get that just gnarly disc space and you have to do a lot of drilling to actually recreate it to get that osteophytic ridge off of the cord in the back? You know, with end plates like that, like what do you end up doing? You know, yeah, that's a great question. I, 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 I'm, I don't know. Um, because then you probably, because I think that cadaver know. labs, I mean, gosh, yeah. we do so many cadaver like trials and, you know, and it's I only did lumbar. I didn't do cervical. 
Yeah. Oh, uh, because you know you're not you're not you're you're kind of just getting what you get. But like when we're treating somebody, well, a lot of times in these cases, the end plates are just completely eroded, and you know you yeah. really are recreating something. I mean, even thinking about it in the lumbar spine as well as the cervical. I just think we have so much more to learn and grow. I think that's the point. Yeah. Amen to that. Yeah, and that's why a context donor, I guess, where you wouldn't use it. You'd have to use it in select cases, kind of like arthroplasty. Even within arthroplasty, you know, like the MOBC, for example, it has that domed, uh, you know, superior um, um, sort of uh, end plate contact. But oftentimes the dome of the arthroplasty device does not match the dome of the patient's anatomy. Um, and so even if that, if yeah, those are custom, you know, that would be kind of nice. And it's really lock it in and in, in midline and especially for uh, an arthroplasty like the MOBC, which is fairly uh, loose and not fixed it, upon implantation relies on, um, you know, compression in the disc space, which I've learned all too well recently, but 